Hello, this is a British Psychological Society audio interview. I'm Wendy Barnaby and I'm joined by Richard Stevens, who's a senior psychology lecturer at Keele University. And Richard, we're going to be talking about your research into swearing, which on the face of it seems a rather unusual topic for research. How did it uh, first suggest itself to you? It's come about from observing things in everyday life and being curious about them and then finding ways to kind of bring them to work and find ways of studying and researching them. So my daughter was born, second daughter, and it was quite a long, complicated labour. And, you know, when we got beyond the 20-hour mark, the contractions were coming on quite hard. And my wife was in a lot of pain and she swore. And then the contractions would ease and she'd be a little bit embarrassed. And then they'd come again and she'd swear again. And this was kind of how it went and it was all fine. But the interesting thing about that is... The reaction of the uh, midwives and doctors when my wife was apologising, it's like, don't apologise, we have this all the time. This is a completely normal part of giving birth. So I thought, right, swearing and pain, they go together. I wonder why. Does it help? What's the purpose of it? So that was the impetus. And what we eventually came up with was giving people a pain challenge, an ice cold water challenge. How long can you keep your hand immersed in some ice cold water? Getting them to swear and seeing if it if the pain was eased by this. So we um, had a, a very simple experiment. People immersed their hand in ice cold water under two different conditions. In one, they repeated a swear word of their choice. In another, they repeated a neutral word, which uh, my students came up with this, uh, a word to describe a table. The basic finding is that people, not everybody, but on a, uh, mo the majority of a group, 75% or so, can keep their hand in the ice water longer if they repeat a swear word than a neutral word. And then if you look at the average time in the water across the two conditions, it's uh, across a dozen or more studies in my lab, it's always, it's a robust effect. It always works. People keep their hand in the water for longer. And how do you explain that? Well, we also uh, have been measuring heart rate in these studies to try and get an idea of some of the underlying sort of psychobiology, uh, how the body is responding as well as the kind of psychology. And uh, when you put your hand in ice cold water, your heart accelerates anyway because it's a, it's, it's, it is a stressful stimulus. But we found um, that heart rate accelerates more with swearing in the ice cold water than with the neutral word. So, so our hypothesis then is swearing is emotional language. When you swear, you are triggering an emotional response in yourself, a stress response in effect, fight or flight response. That's manifest as the increase in heart rate. And the fight or flight response has a known pain reducing aspect, it's called stress induced analgesia. But we have got some data in our lab at the moment where we run a swearing study and um, we haven't shown any fight or flight response. So it's the degree of confidence in that finding is a little bit uh, diminished. The other uh, interesting area we've moved forward to is to look at a bit more in detail about the idea of swearing as emotional language, okay? So swearing is theorized as emotional language. And there's kind of anecdotal evidence, you know, people see it being emotional language. And interestingly, not just negative emotion. There's a really nice story, not these Olympics, but the previous ones. One of the British women unexpectedly got a bronze medal in the windsurfing. And the BBC stuck a microphone like you've got here, just as she's getting out the water. You won a bronze medal, how'd you feel? Live television, fucking amazing. So it, it's not just negative emotion, it's positive emotion, so it's a whole range of emotions. And you've now done some new work. The premise is this, if swearing is emotional language, if you make people emotional, they should get better at swearing. What we define as being better at swearing is swearing fluency. How many different swear words can you come up with in a minute? Okay, that's the task, they write them down. And then we made people emotional, they either played a shoot them up video game for 10 minutes and went around killing people, and that made them feel aggressive, or they played a golf game. And then we got them to do the swearing fluency task. And I can't tell you the results, because <laughs> we're releasing it in the annual conference in May. So, um, watch that watch, uh, watch this space. <laughs> what about if you turn this round, Richard? I mean, so far we've been looking at the effects of swearing and how we might think of it and so on. But could we turn that round and say, well, this means we can actually use swearing sometimes in certain situations. Could we do that, perhaps? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely don't see why not. 
the most obvious kind of application so far is, you know, you're in an accident, the emergency services are 10 minutes away, you're in a lot of pain. Yeah, probably a good idea to swear then, probably do you a bit of good, that could be advice, couldn't it? And in fact, interestingly, I've had a few letters and emails from, from members of the public over the years who've sort of described scenarios. There was a guy who was in a cycling accident and um, the medics kind of picked him up off the street and they were cutting off his trousers to see what the damage was. And it was agony and he swore. And apparently he was chastised for it by the attending medical staff. And he obviously had a, an anger about that that was there for a long time. And he sort of said, thank you for the research because I feel vindicated in that response. What about people who swear all the time? I mean, some swear words have just been, they're woven into the language and people don't even know that they're using them half the time. We're, we're in a bit of an interesting phase at the moment because the worst swear words, for, for instance, are, are sort of not that bad anymore. They're on TV, they're, you know, they're, they're everywhere. So we're perhaps on, a, on the threshold of a, of, of a new era. Uh, I mean, the new taboos, it's really about taboo, isn't it? That sex is kind of old hat now and the new taboos are things like racism and, and religious taboos and they're the, you know, the real no-go areas. So you think that they'll be the source of swear words coming up? It, it would be logical to think that. If you're trying to shock or, you know, that, that, that's what these words do, they break taboos and, you know, that is a big deal. Swearing. I mean, when you consider all the things psychology research could be about, isn't this a bit frivolous, really? You might say that, but it's great for teaching psychology. People are interested in it. You can apply the full range of types of approaches that psychology research uses, experiments, qualitative research, surveys, looking at how frequently people swear and things like that, and what it, it, it correlates with things like social class, things like intelligence. So, you, so it's great. It's a great teaching device. Moreover, I found a website which was transcripts of black box recordings, you know, in-flight in data recordings of planes that crashed and the people died. And the number of instances where the last few things people said was a swear word. Because of course, if you, you know, oh shit, you know, I'm going to die. It's, it's, it's how, you, how we express these things. So from mothers giving birth to pilots on black box records, it's literally the language of life or death. So I think that makes it uh, an important topic. Thank you, Richard, very much indeed. Okay, thank you.